Good morning. morning. We're glad to have you in our service this morning. Thank you for coming. I know we've got a good many visitors with us. We have uh, five different candidates for uh, baptism uh, here at the end of our service. And uh, we know we've got uh, their uh, relatives uh, and friends uh, with them. And we thank you for coming and uh, appreciate you doing so. Hope that you enjoy your time with us uh, today. And uh, we, uh, we certainly do appreciate you coming and supporting them. We're going to do a few announcements right quick like uh, before we get our service uh, started uh, today. Uh, first, uh, as um, folks here at church know, we're getting ready for our uh, fiscal year uh, starting in September. And that means we have to fill our officers and teachers role. Uh, I have the sheet in front of me and uh, we've done a pretty good job of filling most of that out. One of the places that's going to be most difficult uh, to fill out uh, that uh, we have left is on Wednesday night and that is our first through third graders. Uh, That's the class Mandy has been uh, doing, and she's not going to be doing it next year, and so we need a teacher for that. That's our first through third graders. So if you would uh, please uh, think about that, pray about it, and uh, uh, put your name down there, uh, that would greatly be appreciated. Uh, Also, um, let's see. Uh, I think that's the worst. We have a nursery open in Sunday school time, uh, someone to help uh, that. That class is available uh, for someone, I think, uh, for Sunday school. That's all that we have left. Most of what's left here is going to be filled out tonight during a deacon's meeting. Um, There's just things that we'll normally fill in during those periods of time. So you've done a good job, and I appreciate that, uh, signing up for the different different things that we have available for that. So we appreciate that. Do need that class on Wednesday night uh, for that. All right, then things we've got uh, coming up, of course, is our uh, Wednesday uh, night um, uh, prayer meeting time. We uh, appreciate you coming and being for that, 6.30 uh, uh, for it. This afternoon is um, time for those that are involved in filming for our Christmas specials. Um, You know who you are involved in that, so it starts at 2 o'clock, so please uh, come and and uh, be available for that. I think you have a lunch for some of the folks involved. You know that that's involved in it. So that's all uh, all that is coming and uh, for that. So everybody uh, fill in your places uh, for that. You know who you are in those things. Dale has uh, got most of you uh, uh, a place for that, and, and you know about it. So uh, those things are taking place. Uh, Saturday morning, we have our uh, boys and men's breakfast uh, at uh, 7.30. You're invited to come. We have a good breakfast. Uh, We try to have it ready right about 7.30 so you can come and enjoy that time with us. Uh, Then you can uh, be done and go about the business that uh, you want to be involved in uh, there. So... uh, Uh, Just join us. Uh, Guys, bring bring your sons with you. Uh, Bring friends if you'd like to bring some guys with you that uh, you'd like to have come and see what's going on here. So uh, that's uh, 7.30 next Saturday morning uh, for breakfast. So we encourage you to come and be involved in that um, next uh, Saturday morning. And then at 9 o'clock, our planning committee is going to meet. And so uh, uh, we will uh, be looking at some of the things we've got involved uh, in in the coming up in the church. One of the things we need to start getting ready for is beginning on September the 9th, uh, we will have our men's conference at 7 o'clock. Abraham Hamilton uh, III is going to be uh, speaking. Is he the second or third, y'all? Which one is he? Fourth, fifth? Abraham is coming and uh, uh, speaking, and uh, he's looking forward to it. I've been talking with him, and uh, we are, we're looking forward to him speaking. That's the men's conference. I know we usually have it the last Sunday uh, in uh, August and have a breakfast with that. Things had to change this year, several things going on, so it's going to be um, uh, September the 9th, and then starting the 10th, uh, we will have revival. He's going to be preaching revival for us, and uh, Isabella will be joining starting on Sunday night with Isabella Church and be coming down here, and uh, so we'll be doing that, and that'll be through Wednesday night the 13th, so that's coming up quicker than we really uh, think about it sometimes, so those things will be going, and then you'll see that we also have on the 23rd Olivia Lane concert, a family event, and we'll be having a covered dish uh, uh, supper before that. So all of those things are taking place. Our regular conference, as you see, is uh, scheduled for the 16th. We're going to move it uh, to the 23rd, and that will be, I think, a a meal with that uh, conference there. So those things are taking place. Deacons, we have our deacons meeting this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Deacons meeting at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Any other announcement we need to talk about now? 
any other announcement that we need to talk about that I have not gone over very briefly right there. All right, sounds like I got those covered. Charlie's going to lead us in singing then. All right, Bruce talked about it Wednesday night about we need a, a mirror of y'all. Y'all need to smile more. You know, look at you, smile now. Come on now. Basically, these people, the visitors had to come sit on the front row. Here. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> but look, let's, let's sing with enthusiasm this morning Victory in Jesus. So let's all stand. 353, Victory in Jesus. Take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 2. Oh, sounds like most of the pages have quit turning. All right, scripture says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. 
and my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the, the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of God except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For he has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Charlie, would you lead us in prayer? Dear Father, we just thank you for the much for this day you've given us, Lord. Just thank you for this this group that's come out this morning. Just thank you for those that, that have been baptized and make the most important decision they've ever made in their life. Lord, just thank you for those that, that, that help lead them in the right direction. Just be with the church. Let's reach out to the lost. Lord, uh, if there's one here that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, this morning, just let them come forward. Lord, just be with us. Take care of us. Look after this country. Uh, let's put the right people in power. Lord, let's look and trust to you for everything. Christ and pray. Amen. Good morning. How y'all doing? That's good. I'm good too, but I'm like all thumbs today. Have you ever heard that being all thumbs? What would you What would you think if you had only thumbs and you didn't have all your other fingers? Kind of be hard to hold on to things and do things, wouldn't it? That's me today. <laughs> y'all, I really need to talk to God about something. Do y'all happen to know the phone number to heaven? Does anybody know the phone number to heaven? You don't? Well, how? Well, does anybody have the address? I can get some paper and I can write a letter. Does anybody know the address to heaven? Y'all don't know the address to heaven? Well, how am I going to talk to God then? What was that? You pray. You're right. Wouldn't, don't you kind of wish you could pick up the phone sometimes and just call heaven? Say, dear Lord, please, I need a direct line. <laughs> Lots of times I need that. Or sometimes it seems like it'd be nice to be able to sit down and draw maybe a picture to God or write a, a sweet letter and be able to put it in the mail and send it to him. Wouldn't that be nice? But we can't do that, can we? No, we can't do that. But we can pray. We can pray. Do you know how to pray or what to pray for? Are you supposed to pray for what? What's something you pray for? For him a present. Oh, that, yeah. God would love for us to pray for him a present. So I don't think we can give him anything that he doesn't already have, except we can praise him, can't we? We can tell him how good a great a person he is and being and all the things he does for us and that he gave us life and things like that. So we can praise God. That's right. What's some other things we can pray about? Y'all are little. 
So y'all may not quite think like I do, but I bet sometimes are you scared? If you're what? Scared or hurting, that's right. Do you ever get scared? Well, you can talk to God about it. God knows everything that's in your heart. And if you're scared, you can tell him about it. Because guess what? He actually already knows. He just wants you to come to him and talk to him about it. So I've got a memory verse. Remember, I told y'all I'm all thumbs today. So y'all got to give me just a second. My son would probably say I'm all thumbs all the time. (laughs) Is that right, David? Yep, that's what I thought. (laughs) Okay. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Did you hear that? What was that place? When you seek him with all your what? Heart. Your heart. If you know somebody that's sick, sometimes it makes us sad when we know somebody who's sick. And that's kind of, we, it lays on our heart and we worry about them. Well, you know what? God wants you to tell him about that. And when you're scared, that kind of affects your heart too because sometimes it gets all racing and you're just all scared and everything. But he, he wants you to tell him about that too. And he, he definitely loves to hear, especially ones your age, sing praises to him and tell him thank you and how much you love him. And he likes to hear y'all talk about your, how much you love your family and things like that, and thank him for those things. So I just wanted to have a little talk about prayer. I sure wish, I still wished I had um, a telephone number. If y'all find it, will y'all let me know? If y'all ever come up with a phone, a phone number for heaven, will you let me know? I'm telling you, I really need it. Mr. Mitchell, I need to call heaven about him sometimes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's really he needs to call, call heaven about me. <laughs> All right, well, just remember, our, like our memory verse says, you will seek me, so if you seek God, and if you will find him when you seek him with all of your what? Heart. So whatever's on your heart, tell that to God, whether it's something you're worried about, something you're scared about, something you're thinking about like somebody else, any of that, make sure you take it to God. Just tell him about it. And I'm going to give you a little sample of how to do that in our closing prayer, okay? So close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And we thank you for the beautiful sunshine. And we even thank you for the rain when it falls, dear Lord, on the earth. Dear Lord... We just, um, we love you, and we know that you know what we're thinking about and what we're worried about, and dear Lord, there's so many people who are sick, and we just ask that you'll take care of those sick people, and that the ones that are hurt, that you'll heal them, and you'll bring them back to good health, and dear Lord, we thank you for our families and our friends, and we especially thank you for our preacher and all the people in our church, dear Lord. We just love you and ask that you'll be with us and take care of us and lead us through each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Usually I don't have anything to add to Tanya's Children's Corner because she pretty much covers it. But I'm going to tell you, in my personal life, it is a lot easier talking to God than calling him on the telephone. <laughs> it is because you don't have to worry about cell signals, where you're on the tower. And like we, my IT department worked thought of a genius idea of giving me a new phone. Like they had to pry the flip phone out of my hand five years ago. And, and I got another phone. Then they decided, oh, you need another phone, Charlie, for whatever reason. And I, if it wasn't for Dale up there, I wouldn't have a clue because you're supposed to hold up your face so it's knowing it's you and you're supposed to swipe up this way. And look, all I do is hello, goodbye, and take a picture so I can send it to John Deere. That's all I do with the phone. But my point is, God's a whole lot easier to talk to just speaking to God and praying than fooling with a phone because his cell towers are never over the hill or anything like that. All right.
enough of that? Did I do good, Tanya? You did great. Thank you. All right. You're uh, not all cubs, Charlie. I'm not. No, thank goodness. <laughs> all right. Uh, off to him, number 56. God be the glory. Let's all stand. day, Lord. Thank you for everything you've blessed us with, Lord. Thank you for giving us this day that we can gather here and worship you in your house, Lord. Thank you, Father, for each and every person who's going to be baptized this morning, Lord. It's uh, wonderful, Lord, that we see five people, Lord, that have given their life to you, Lord. We pray that you'll be with them and be with our church, Lord, as we uh, help them as they uh, hurt our new Christians, Lord. Uh, thank you for giving us this church, Lord. Thank you for each and every person here this morning, Lord. Pray that you'll be with Brother Bruce as he brings us a message and bless his tithe and offering to your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church, where our purpose is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. Thank y'all for singing this morning. Let's take our Bibles and go over to the book of John, chapter 3. We're going to pick up reading in verse 22. <clears throat> we'll read down through the fourth chapter and the third verse. John chapter 3, <clears throat> I'm going to begin uh, reading in verse 22. <clears throat> Those of you that can, would you please stand in honor of the word of God as I read. John records for us. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Aon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John did not, had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled." He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthy and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> so placed between um, these two uh, narratives of Nicodemus and the woman at the well is uh, this um, story, this narrative that we have uh, here for us uh, about Jesus and John the Baptist. And I tried to just um, not really deal with this. I tried just to move on to the uh, woman at the well. Uh, it is uh, uh, these two things that we're looking at uh, that John opens the gospel with that shows us salvation both to that uh, man that is of religion, of the highest form, uh, the Jewish religion. Uh, he was a man uh, that was of the highest part of the Jewish religion, and of course, this Samaritan woman that is the lowest of all. Uh, she is a woman that has uh, been married several times, is now living with a man, has a false religion there in Samaria, and so you have the juxtaposition there of these two, but yet here the gospel comes uh, to both of them, and of course, that is the gospel of John. That's what it's written to us for so that we can see that. And, but the more I looked at it, the more I just could not have 
myself go past this. I believe there's something, at least one thing, and a couple of things that we need to see in this passage uh, here that I could not just skip over. And so uh, the, I, I, uh, the Holy Spirit would not let me uh, just go past this particular passage. So let's look at it uh, this morning and see if it won't speak to us uh, in it. So um, uh, John records for us uh, that uh, Jesus now, after the uh, things that we talked about, he had driven the money changers out of the temple. So uh, he had gained notoriety. Uh, he had, he had uh, done many miracles. If you go back and read some of the other passages of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And now uh, he had begun what uh, John the Baptist uh, was doing. Uh, folks were coming to him. They were repenting. And now they were also baptizing many people. And uh, so this put them out there in, in uh, what many folks saw as competition with uh, John the Baptist. We'll see that in just a second. And so uh, as he preached, folks would come, and uh, we find that the uh, uh, disciples would then uh, baptize uh, these folks. Uh, uh, when we read the very first part of this passage, it appears like uh, that uh, Jesus himself is baptizing folks. But then that's the reason I read over into chapter 4 for us so that we would understand uh, in the second verse it says Jesus himself did not baptize, that it was actually his disciples that were doing the baptism. Can you imagine uh, what would have uh, happened if Jesus himself literally was doing the baptism. They would have been folks out there that would have started their own sect, their own religion. I was baptized by Jesus. I'm, a, I'm, I'm one that's special. I, I have this special anointing. I'm a baptized by Jesus person. I didn't get baptized by John. I didn't get baptized by Matthew. I didn't get baptized by Peter. I got baptized by Jesus himself. I'm different. I mean, it would have been something else if Jesus himself had been out there baptizing this person or that person or the other person. Of course, the wisdom of our Lord uh, was much greater than that. And uh, so he did not baptize anyone uh, himself, knowing what would come from that. Uh, it was his disciples, and the Bible is careful to note uh, that for us to see that Jesus himself. As a matter of fact, when we read over later on into the life of the Apostle Paul, as he goes forth into the ministry, we find that he didn't do a whole lot of baptizing himself. He would, he would note there was a few folks along that for one reason or the other that he would baptize, but mostly he left the baptizing up to other folks to do. And so um, as uh, these two ministries uh, went along, we find out there was a period of time here. It was a fairly short period of time, but there was a period of time that John the Baptist was still at work and Jesus now was at work. But something was happening here. As Jesus worked, Jesus began to do something that John the Baptist never did. Jesus performed miracles. Jesus would do extraordinary things. And these John the Baptist never did. And for this, the folks began to flock to the Lord Jesus. And they began to leave John the Baptist. And this left John the Baptist with smaller and smaller and smaller groups of folks coming to him. And of course, those that were uh, drawn to him, those disciples that loved him and walked with him, they began to notice this, and it began to cause some problems uh, in their hearts. And the devil knew this, and he saw this, and he took opportunity uh, to see if he couldn't cause a rift between John the Baptist and Jesus. And this is one of the things I want us to look at uh, this morning, because I think it can uh, give us great warning that we need to have. So uh, uh, we, we see the Bible tells us in this period of time that John hadn't been thrown into prison. And in comes this Jewish fellow, probably a Pharisee, and he begins to poke and see if he can't cause a problem. So he starts arguing about purification. Notice that Jesus, back in his first miracle, he had used the purification jars to pour water in that turned the water into wine. It's no accident that the devil comes and uses this argument of purification to try to cause the problem. The, the devil, give him his due. Uh, he, he is a sneak. He, he, he uses the tools that he sees here. He, he uses that that would be the most effective. He, he's paying attention. Um, he looks and sees uh, what is, is most effective in the life 
of John the Baptist and those around him so that he can do the most damage that's going on here. And so they're arguing about uh, why and how purification ought to be used. Now, that's not really the argument that ought to be going on. Here was the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, performing miracles and proving that he was God come down from heaven. And uh, uh, John was the forerunner pointing to the Christ. And they ought to have been searching their hearts and being made ready for the message of the gospel. Uh, But of course, they were busy about unimportant things. So here they come running to John, uh, all upset about these things, and they call him rabbi. Now, of course, when you're going to uh, try to instigate, and this is what's going on. They're going to try to instigate jealousy. That's what the devil has insinuated in their hearts. They're going to try to instigate jealousy in the heart of John the Baptist about what is taking place in the ministry of Jesus. They want John to be jealous that all these folks and some that had come to him and and were now going to Jesus. And when John looked out there where there had been multitudes coming to him, now they were just small groups, very, very small. And uh, so uh, they wanted to make sure that this jealousy sank into the heart of John the Baptist. Now, the devil knows there's two times in people's lives when you're the most vulnerable. That's when you're on the mountaintop. That's when things are going great. The old devil, he'll insinuate into your heart or through the forces of the devil. I don't give him more. He he just can be in one place at a time. He's not omniscient. He can't be everywhere. But through the forces of the devil, he'll insinuate in your heart, well, look how good you are. Look how great you are. Look, look what you're doing. Look, he wants you to take credit for what's going on so that you lift yourself up and pride begins to enter your heart and you begin to think that you are some something. You're somebody rather than realizing that this is the work of God and that it's God doing the work and you're just a vessel. God can choose any vessel. He may have this time have chosen you and for that you may be uh, should be grateful and humble because God can choose anybody. God doesn't need us. God chooses to use us. That's what we need to understand. And so we need to be humble and, 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 and grateful and thankful when God does that. The other time that we're the most vulnerable is when things are, are low. When God uh, chooses to place us with just a small uh, uh, group or just a small ministry or just a small task. And in that same place, we ought to be at the same spot. We ought to be thankful that God has chosen us to do anything. We're not worthy to do anything. And so if God chooses uh, uh, for us to do a small task, we ought to be just as grateful as when we're on the mountaintop doing a great task. But the devil knows it's the inclination of our hearts at either place, if we're doing the small things, the bully grub. And to look at that person that has a large man and say, oh, I'm just, I'm so pitiful and so useless and uh, I'm so worthless and uh, just to get down rather than to remain in that place of joy and thankfulness no matter where I've been. The apostle Paul would put it this way. I've learned in my life to be thankful no matter where I find myself. No matter whether I have much or whether I have little, I realize I'm just a servant of the living God. And I'll be happy just to be a servant because that's all I'm ever going to be. Whether I'm serving in large things or small things, the key is I am a servant all the time. I'm never a master, no matter where I be. And so here they come at John the Baptist and they say to him, Rabbi, they make sure that they build him up and say, that fellow, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, speaking of Jesus, The one that you testified of, he's baptizing a lot, and all are coming to him. That's not quite true. Some were still coming to John the Baptist, but a great many were. John didn't take the bait. And that's so important, folks. Don't take the bait. He'd thrown it out there, and they were reeling it in. I don't know if y'all are like me. 
Some are, some aren't. Hopefully you're not too much like me. I, I've been watching this last few weeks uh, on uh, TV, uh, Shark Weeks. I, I, that's things I like to watch. And, uh, and so uh, I don't know what's wrong with folks. <laughs> Sharks will hurt you. Uh, they won't hurt me. It'll be a sand shark that gets me. <laughs> but they go out there and they throw bait in the water to get sharks to come out there and jump in the water with them. Mental. they just mental. That's all I got to say. They bait the sharks. They go out there and they, they'll pull those sharks up to them. And they'll go, whoosh. Then we, we watched Jaws 1 the other day. Just behind that. Now I'm going to the beach here in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I like to watch Jaws right before I go to the beach. That confirms I'm not getting in the water. I doubt I'll even get in the pool. I'm going to be safe. And so, uh, you know, John didn't take the bait. They were trying to get him to be jealous of what was happening in the ministry of Jesus. But see, John knew something. John knew what God had called him to do. He knew his ministry. He knew what was supposed to be done by John, John the Baptist. And he was satisfied to be John the Baptist. Now that's the key, folks. He was satisfied with what God had called him to do. And that's what we have to learn. Are you satisfied with being the best at what God has called you to do? If God has called you to teach a children's class with five children in it, will you be the best Sunday school teacher for those five kids that God has called you to be? Will you study and pour your life into that class and be the best Sunday school teacher? Because you don't know who's sitting in that Sunday school class in front of you. For certain, there are some moms and dads sitting there that are going to uh, most likely have kids one day, and they're going to have to raise those kids and uh, teach them about the Lord. Are you willing to do that? Say, well, I wanted to teach thousands. Well, maybe you did, but God's called you to teach those kids. If that's what God has called, be satisfied. For us that, that preach. If God's called you to preach to the church of 50 and that's what he wants you to do, I want to tell you all to prepare and preach to that church of 50 like they're 50,000. And you ought not to always be looking for another place to preach. If God wants to put you in another place, he'll take care of that. If God wants you to preach to 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 or 10,000, that's God's business. Quit being dissatisfied. I hear preachers all the time dissatisfied preaching where they are. I want to tell you, you better find out where God has called you and equipped you to preach and preach there and be happy and preach with all of your heart right there. Quit always looking for somewhere else. I know there are not a whole lot of preachers here. I preach to myself a little bit. I'm listening. So, uh, so here he said, John answered him and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You know, I've borne witness. I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. He said, I know what I've been called to do. And listen, brothers, I'm doing it. John was happy doing what he'd been called to do. Just because the crowds dwindled, John didn't go away, pout, sit under the juniper tree, and wait for the world to end. He kept doing his job. He used the illustration then of a uh, wedding with a bride and a groom and the uh, best man. And he said, the best man doesn't pout because the uh, bridegroom takes the bride. That's what he's supposed to do. He's joyful. He's happy. And he said, as John the Baptist, I'm happy that the bridegroom has come. What's wrong with you guys? And he says that statement that hopefully most folks that have been in church has heard many times. He says, he that is Christ must increase, but I must decrease. Listen, here, listen, church. And you that have other churches that you go to. Here is the key if you are truly doing church. 
If folks are talking about your church, about other things of your church, and what your church is doing more than what it is talking about, what Christ is in your church, something is wrong. The, the number one singular thing that a church ought to be known for is that it lifts Christ Jesus up. Jesus is the center of the church. If a preacher is thought of more in the church than Christ, something is wrong. If folks love the preacher more than they love Christ, something is wrong. If a preacher has more interest in the church, if, he, if he's respected more than the Savior, something is wrong. If the church's programs are thought of better than the name of Jesus, something is wrong. The church is here to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus that came and bled and died and rose again. It is not a preacher. It is not a Sunday school. It is not a choir. It is not a program. The church is about the Lord Jesus Christ. As he is raised up and lifted up and his, his name is brought forward, that is when a church is powerful and that is when the devil takes notice. When a, when, a, when a church is in turmoil and they're bickering about every little thing, that's when Jesus is not being lifted up, I can tell you. When they're arguing about what type of music to sing, when they're arguing what type of Bible to preach out of, when they're arguing about uh, colors and times, they have forgotten the central message and gone off on arguing about other things. But when Jesus is in the center and Jesus is being lifted up, they don't have time to argue about these other things because Jesus then is the central center of their church and he is the main and important thing. But when you get off center, then all these other things creep in. And you have all these other problems come along. He says, he who comes from above is above all. John says, Jesus comes from above. Nobody else has ever come from above. Everybody else comes from here. We're earthly. We come from the earth. Adam was made of the earth. We all are descendants of Adam. But Jesus comes from above. He came from glory. Yes, Eve conceived of the Holy Spirit and brought forth Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came from above. All others, he says, is those that are from below. He has already seen what is above. He testifies what he knows. He is telling us not what he thinks is there. He is telling us what he knows is in heaven. He certifies that which is true. He is telling us that which God has already spoken to him. He says, verse 34, God has given to him that which is above the spirit without measure. No man can ever have said that except the Lord Jesus. No other man has the Spirit of God without measure. No great man. Moses did not have the Spirit without measure. David did not have the Spirit without measure. Isaiah did not have the Spirit without measure. Daniel did not have the Spirit without measure. No man had the Spirit without measure except the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was full, the Bible says, from his conception, filled with the Holy Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure. So verse 35 says, the father loves the son. Now that is a tremendous statement. The Bible says, God Almighty, the father, loves Jesus Christ. He loves him with all that love contains. Everything that love is the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. You need to understand that. They, that needs to be incorporated in your thinking so that you understand what takes place when Jesus goes to the cross. 
We, we, we have not yet drawn all that there is and we need to draw to understand what it was for Jesus to be given by the Father to the cruelty of the cross to die for our sins. When Jesus prayed in the garden and said, Father, if this cup could pass for me, let it pass. And then he says, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Knowing that the Father, without measure, loves the Son so infinitely, and yet, and in spite of that, He would allow His Son to die on the cross for sinners like me and you. See, that says that infinite love that He loved the Son is then poured out on those that accept the Son's gift. That love not only is measured to the Son, it is then measured out to everyone that accepts the Son. So he says in verse 36, and then closing, says then, knowing that, since he has given all things into his Son's hands, that he who believes in the Son then has everlasting life. Because of that infinite love for the Son, and that Son being willing to die for us, that love of God then overflows to us, and because of that, we then have everlasting life. That's how we attain to everlasting life. Not because we deserve it, but because the love of the Father through the Son has then overflowed to us. What amazing love. What genuine, tremendous care. And that's the reason then he does say, and he who does not believe the Son shall not have life. And then the darkest statement in the Word. It's only mentioned in a few places. But the wrath of God abides on him. That is, the one that does not believe in the Son, the wrath of God abides him. I know some folks do not believe that the wrath of God abides on folks. But the Word of God says it does, and for that reason, it does. So this morning, you have a choice. You can have the overflowing love of God or the wrath of God. And every person in this room makes that choice. Either the love of God through Jesus or the wrath of God without Jesus. And the great news is, it's your choice to make today. The Bible says you may come, but he won't force you to come. He loves you enough to realize there's no true love that is ever forced on someone. Yet you must freely come. You must want that overflowing, amazing, majestic love but you must want to come. It must be your decision to accept that love. Are you in the love of God? Have you accepted that amazing love? The Bible says all you have to do is ask. Ask, and you'll receive. Ask. That, Father, I don't have that love, but I want it. Would you pour out on me a sinner, not deserving of it, but because your son has said I can have it, would you pour out your amazing love and make me your child? If you'll do that today, I promise you, God will pour out on you the amazing love of God, and you'll never be the same. If not, you'll walk away from here under the wrath of God. Father, speak to hearts today. For that one that sees and has been blinded by the devil and sees difficulty in coming to God, open their eyes that they may see that it is very simple. All they have to do is ask for your love 
and you'll make a way. You'll open up the road and pour out the love, and they'll know how then to come to you. Let no one walk away under the wrath of God today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand.